Hello guys, welcome to another episode of the Commerce Lab by Ecomsy, the place where everything related to Amazon FBA private level and e-commerce. My name is Vincenzo Toscano, founder and CEO of Ecomsy, and today we bring you another special guest. His name is Steve Yates, and he's the CEO of Prime Guidance, which I would say is one of the top consultancies out there when it comes to helping you scale your business on Amazon. That's why I wanted to bring Steve today, because we spent an amazing time in Hawaii for the Billion Dollar Summit. Uh, organized by Kevin King. And when I saw, you know, mm -hmm. some of the nuggets that Steve was sharing with me, I, I thought to myself, he definitely needs to be on the show and share some wisdom with my community. And it's a pleasure to have you today on the show, Steve. So how you doing, my friend? Thanks, Vincenzo. Great to be on. Thanks thank for you. Me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So I guess for those that might not know you, let's start with a quick um, introduction because I know you have so many years of experience in the space and you mainly specialize on things that have to do on, on consulting big companies that really want to figure out the Amazon game, which is going to be part of the conversation today. Things such as when do we need to expand internationally? When we go a 1P or 3P, things like that. So for people to understand where your experience comes from, tell us a little bit about Steve. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, my, uh, my entire career basically has been in e-commerce. I, I started in retail early on in my career and in 1999 started in e-commerce for a company called GSI Commerce and GSI, uh, was later bought out by eBay. Um, yeah, I it was kind of like an e-commerce bootcamp. I was employee number 40 when I started and, and we had 5,000 employees doing $3 billion when I left. Um, wow. and it was a, it was a real, real fun ride. We, we ran hundreds of websites for companies that, um, uh, are now you know thriving like Dick's Sporting yeah. Goods, for example, uh, with their own e-commerce business. But you know, in the early days, people didn't necessarily believe in e-commerce, and and they outsourced it to GSI Commerce. Um, uh, so eBay purchased uh, GSI, and and I went back to Dick's Sporting Dick's Sporting Goods and and headed up their uh, e-commerce team. Uh, did that for a few years and moved on to Amazon, where I um, also. Uh, led an e-commerce uh, team uh, focused on buying of sporting goods. So, wow. uh, you know, spent a few years at Amazon and realized that, uh, boy, there was a lot of companies that just, they didn't realize the business potential they were leaving uh, by, by just kind of riding the coattails of Amazon and, and not really capturing market share. They were, they were happy with their 30% gains every year and not realizing, right. you know, just how much potential is out there. And I'm like, you guys should be doing you know, three thousand percent growth, not not thirty percent growth. Um, so uh, when I started, you know, getting people asking me to do consulting, I realized that there was a lot of uh, a lot of people that needed help back in the, in the day, and and there wasn't a lot of consultancies. There was agencies wanted to do everything for you, and and I, I really found that Amazon had a great approach. You do what's good for the customer, and everything else kind of falls in place. I mean, they offered. You know, faster shipping than anyone you know ever demanded. They offered, you know, additional services that people never uh, demanded. But it became you you became brand loyal to Amazon. Um, so we did the same thing. We launched a consultancy that was all about what's good for the client, meaning like month to month engagements, uh, no percentage of revenue, uh, just you know teaching them to fish, if you will, like building mm -hmm. up their teams and helping them accelerate their business and. And because of that, we've never had to advertise. It's all been word of mouth advertising. Um, and we've helped some amazing brands along the way. Wow, that's that's amazing, man. And I think the beauty of, of that journey is that I'm sure you had so many obstacles that you had to overcome when it comes to figure out these things for your clients. That, uh, at the end of the day, that's what built you as a consultant, you know, because at the end of the day, this mm -hmm. even happened to me as a seller. All the mistakes I did with myself and, and, and my employees is done what it for me as a person to then, you know, be knowledgeable in the space and be able to now consult these companies that sometimes, as you said, they have a very small mindset of what can be achieved. And then we lay down the foundation on a table, like, guys, this is where you actually should be going. It's mind blowing for some of them, right? Um, and that's what I want to mm -hmm. highlight actually today, because I feel uh, when it comes to strategy, Sometimes it's tough if you don't have really a, a good understanding of how Amazon works when you have to make certain strategic moves in your business, right? Uh, before going live, we're talking that one of the main things people struggle with is like when actually I should do an international expansion, right? Because we all know that we always hear about, hey, let's go to Europe, let's go to the Middle East, let's go to Amazon Australia, Amazon Japan. But a lot of times they don't go in depth in terms of what is the criteria that I have to check 
in order for your business to have the best chance towards success when you do that move. So I guess from your perspective and all the business you currently consult, is there maybe a, a checklist that you we can call it that you think business have to go through before doing a move such as that, for example? Yeah, uh, it's a good good question, and we help clients all the time, especially private equity firms when they when they look to buy portfolio companies. They're they're looking at how to how to grow this business as fast as they can, and, and sometimes the aspirations to move uh, international are you know are, are really uh, strong, um, but they don't have the baseline in place. They don't have the you know, the foundation. They don't have the team members and uh, and so forth. So we guide them around what's the right path. And, and it, it should always be on your roadmap, but it's 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 a little bit of art and science on when you should get there and how you should get there. Um, so, um, for example, one of our clients that that we launched with um, uh, a private equity firm uh, came on board um, to to make a, a purchase. We we did an acquisition or an assessment of their business and mm -hmm. determined that it was something that was really really well suited to buy. There was a lot of growth upside. And so forth, and and then they they hired us to kind of run their full, you know, interim management, interim uh, uh, leadership for their for their e-commerce business, um, marketplace business, I should say, um, to to get it up to speed and grow it with the goal of, of expanding rapidly in in, in uh, you know all around Europe and so forth. And um, uh, during that time, you know, we 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 built we grew them from six million in the first year to over twenty five million. Um, on Amazon, and and then also expanded into uh, the very following year, um, Walmart, Target, and eBay, and uh, the second half of that year uh, moved into Europe and got them into all of the European marketplaces. And um, you know, it is it's challenging to run that fast, but the the key is, in my opinion, is don't do it out of order. So to, to basically make sure that you get your Amazon business 80 to 90% where it should be, um, because that's where you're going to have the biggest opportunity. You saw 6 million to 25 million. Mm -hmm. you, you, might, you might find a small percentage of that coming from other marketplaces or other international mm -hmm. properties. So you've got to figure out where, if I'm putting my resources into the same amount of time and effort, where can I get the most gross margin dollars in the bank? And that's going to fuel my growth. Um, so um, you know, we, we really wanted to make sure that that was locked down, that the branding was good, the, the keyword optimization, the advertising, everything's good on US. And then when you get to about 80, 90%, that's when you start shifting to other domestic marketplaces first. Uh, you can generally have the best opportunity on Walmart um, as your secondary marketplace, sometimes eBay, sometimes Target, sometimes Etsy, depends. You know, there's lots of different marketplaces depending on your, your area of specialty. You, you, may, you may find that uh, some work better than others, depending on the category, but you should try and optimize your U.S. domestic marketplaces first and then start looking at where's my customer spending their time and money globally. And that generally your your natural you know, thought process is, well, the biggest marketplaces are going to be U.K. and Germany for Amazon. So U.K. is easy. So, you know, the, the, you don't have the language barrier. So most most of our clients say, hey, that's where I want to start because it's got a balance of ease and size of opportunity but germany actually presents a really sizable opportunity as well and it's got the language barrier so um, typically that's where you want to make sure that um, you, you're focused on those bigger marketplaces but sometimes you're surprised when you actually start doing the research where is your customer spending their time and money and it's not always the biggest marketplaces you might find you've got a huge marketplace opportunity in japan or australia or you know some other marketplace that you're you're kind of really back burnering because you didn't do your research. Um, so a lot of it depends on, you know, what is the type of product? Is it in demand in those other markets? And what's the competitive landscape? And, you know, what are the obstacles to going live? If you're selling supplements or something uh, like the, the client example I just provided to you, there's a lot of roadblocks. You've got to, you've got to have yeah. labeling requirements. You've got to have certifications and so forth. You also have to kind of weigh in all of those things too. Yeah, super important. I think something that you mentioned there that I love is 
essentially having a system in place where you can measure where your efforts are going to give you the best outcome. Because I feel a huge mistake people are doing in the Amazon space is they get distracted very fast by shiny objects. And essentially, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned something there like, OK, my US market is still not fully optimized. But then I start shifting my gear into, OK, let's go to Europe. Let's go now to Japan that's being uh, being uh, noisy in, in the field. Or let's do Walmart. Let's do TikTok shop. And essentially what happens is that rather than you doing a proper research across all these different opportunities and quantify by data where the outcome can be the most uplifting for your business, people have just been driven by attention instead. Like, oh, whatever is making the most noise, that means that's the one that's going to give the solution to my business, right? And we see that mm -hmm. mistake happen all all the time now uh, something mm -hmm. i want to uh, go into is exactly the point that you mentioned like how you actually can identify that your home a country in this case in the states is on an optimal stage in there and therefore you're ready to jump um, to another region is there maybe um, a methodology that you put in place like you compare yourself against the competition you compare against yourself internal milestones how you make this assessment to make sure you have reached certain level of maybe baseline, that now you're ready to make the jump, right? Yeah, there's multiple factors. Um, and one of the, the, the consistent problems I see is that people don't set the bar high enough. They mm -hmm. they think, oh, you know what? I'm actually pretty good in my category. I'm a top brand. Uh, but are you optimizing to the level of the anchors of the world, the billion dollar brand right. selling on Amazon? And are you setting that as your standard? So. I want to be, when I'm looking at a brand, I want to look at the total opportunity. Are they doing everything right uh, from a content standpoint? Are they leveraging all of their infographics properly? Are they testing them? Um, are they uh, utilizing videos? Are they utilizing all the premium A plus modules and, and comparison charts and, and good copywriting with keyword research that was really thorough and precise um, and, and, and executing on all that? And is that working? for them? Are they backing it up with advertising successfully so that they're able to, to have good share of voice on search results, both organic mm -hmm. and paid? Are they, um, are, are they coming across with brand authority? You know, is, are they the brand that, that you should be trusting uh, for that, that product category? And if they, they haven't gotten where they need to be, then there's still more efforts to refine their, their content for optimizations or exposure. You know, obviously, the it's on the data, right? So mm -hmm. you want to look at the data and say, are you having a traffic problem? Are you having a conversion problem? Exactly. And, and what do mm -hmm. I need to do to fix it? Because it may be that my images are horrible or my titles are priced mm -hmm. and I'm getting really poor click-through rates or, or you know, my conversion rates suck and I need to, to boost that. Um, or or I'm just not paying enough on advertising and I, and I need to augment that to get better placement organically um, and be able to stay there. So there's a lot of things that need to be looked into under the covers that are not a one size fits all approach. But if you're not doing all those things and then saying, okay, I feel like my baseline is really good. Like I've got, I've got um, uh, all of these things really well covered. I feel really good about my brand positioning, my, you know, how my brand's looking on, on Amazon and so forth. Because if you don't have that, what you're doing is you're basically copying a bad marketplace into multiple mm -hmm. other global marketplaces. So exactly. you really want to make sure that that's your starting point, your baseline, if you will. And then you just you, know, you can move those those images, those copywriting into other marketplaces and make the tweaks. But you're not making monumental changes across all these marketplaces at a later time. Um, that's really key for efficiency. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you're not setting the bar high enough, you probably don't realize how much you're leaving on the table. Yeah, I would say on top of that, it's something that you have to be mindful is that usually once you reach a, a respectable baseline in terms of the United States, that usually it has allowed you to go through certain phases in terms of figuring out PPC, figuring out conversion issues and things along those lines that given the fact that the U.S. is such a competitive market, by the time you figure out all these elements that are like next level, like top 1% kind of strategies, when you go into Europe and all these other regions, you're pretty much going to blow the market because let's be honest, those regions are much more uh, on a lower tier in terms of uh, execution of strategies because there's less resources and less access mm -hmm. to, you know, a strategy. So I think that's another benefit you're going to get. Like if you master US and then you expand, like you're going to have a much easier journey as well.
That's right. That's right. But you know, one of the problems people you know make is on the flip side, they they don't put it on a roadmap. They don't have a plan. Exactly. If you don't have a plan of where you're trying to go, you know, any road's gonna get you there and you, you just spin spinning in circles. So you've really got to make sure that you even if you're fifty percent of where you need to be, I wanna mm-hmm. know this is when I plan to get to exactly 80, 90% on Amazon US. This is when I plan to expand international or uh, domestically, you know, Walmart, Target, uh, TikTok shop, et cetera. And then uh, here's when I'm going to go internationally. And here's what my game plan is, because okay. some of those markets are rather complicated just to, to get through all the hurdles you need to go through with tax registration. You need to get and, started and somehow. Everything else. You need to get started early enough that you're not now explaining to your you know your board <laughs> why you're why you're behind the eight ball because you didn't plan ahead exactly another thing i also wanted to bring to the table here is you mentioned domestic expansion so this is something that i feel mm-hmm. people also have a confusion like should i go domestic expansion first should i go international expansion like how you make that conscious decision because let's be honest like sometimes yeah. domestic expansion can be more lucrative for a business that uh, going to europe for example so is there also some kind of a uh, assessment that you go through to make that decision yeah. yeah so i i have a philosophy that if i'm a if i'm a brand and mm-hmm. i've got all my customers throughout a particular region mm-hmm. i need to understand where are those customers spending their time and money and i know that Amazon represents about 39% of total e-commerce. They're getting the vast majority. I need to make sure I'm executing well there. But Walmart's growing really fast and they're 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 right up up there as well and as one of the top marketplaces. And yes, it, it, your ROI for the amount of time and effort you you put into it is not going to be as good. It's not going to generate nearly as much revenue. But to me, I'd rather make sure that we're positioned really well in the domestic marketplaces outside of Amazon first before international expansion for, for a couple of reasons. One, you've got feed providers that can can be utilized to push your content into those marketplaces pretty seamlessly. If you're thinking ahead, you know, you need to think about what is this what are the systemic things that I need to put in place to make sure that I can scale the business and also operate ef- efficiently and effectively. And so if you leverage a feed provider like a store automator or rhythm or or one of the the brands um, Channel Advisor, as many people know it is now Rhythm, um, and they, uh, 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 they they can enable you to feed your content more seamlessly in these marketplaces. Uh, and, and once you have that ability, Feedonomics, another another you know e- you know yep. less expensive uh, option, um, then you can you can open up the doors to those other marketplaces more easily. Now the feed is not as great. Once you have those those feeds in place, now it's about how do I not just feed the same content, but change it up? Like, you know, I see it all the time. Companies sell on Walmart and say, well, it's just, it's not producing any results for me. It's like mm-hmm. a waste of my time. And then I start looking into it and, and I've been contacted by, you know, the, the some of the best uh, Walmart sellers looking for, for advice on how do we grow it faster. And even the best Walmart sellers are still oftentimes doing it wrong. They're not looking at the, mm-hmm. the, the depth of the, the way that their algorithms work. They don't work just like Amazon. They're, they're very much different, both in the ad campaign uh, algorithms and, and what types of campaigns they like. Uh, for example, they, automatic campaigns work a lot better on, on Walmart. Exactly. Um, on product listings, you've got to be paying attention to the listing quality score. And it really, really just basically lays it out for you. Here's what you yeah. need to optimize. You tweak it, your score goes up, and you realize what you need to be. I want to see you at 95%, not 70% uh, listing quality score. And if you're not there, yeah. then you're missing the boat. Um, yeah. But your, your, your size of the pie may not be as big, but your percentage of market share capture can be much, much better on Walmart. Yeah. I think another uh, factor that I would like to also um, bring to the conversation is that usually when we talk about expansion, and this could be domestic or internationally, like sometimes people don't take into consideration the fact that you can do this from a 3P perspective, which is what most people do, or the 1P approach, right? I feel uh, yeah. a lot of people don't even bring this to the table as part of the strategy. And I know you were mentioning uh, as well as part of your experience that sometimes you have seen that 1P approach can be more uh, lucrative for uh, brands in terms of uh, 
having a, a easier uh, basically opening in terms of that specific avenue and therefore have less workload on, on their shoulders. So uh, tell us a little bit about what has been your experience with 1P because I know for a fact 1P is also not for everybody. So how do you make also that assessment? Yeah. If, when, whenever you want to do an expansion, you should go 3P or 1P. Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and we help a lot of companies to determine this. Um, and it's not necessarily a, a cookie cutter answer. Um, for example, we work with a lot of private equity firms. And, and when as part of our assessment, we help them understand what is the right path for their business and do a financial model to help them understand, here's the 1P model, here's the 3P model, and here's the hybrid approach. And then if we decide, okay, they're currently a 1P vendor, but we, we think they're going to be seeing more profitability as a 3P seller, then what's the path to get there? And that's not always easy because Amazon sometimes restricts people from moving from 1P to 3P. Um, uh, and, and then on the flip side, sometimes people are only selling as a 3P seller, but they're selling low price point items that don't work. And half of their catalog is not on Amazon. And you're like, you, you know, if you move to a 1P vendor on these products, Amazon looks at their their profitability as a market basket, not an individual item, because they know that they don't have an FBA fee for each individual item. They, they're looking at what is this product commonly purchased with? Can I make sense in the total cost of shipping when, when those items are basketed together um, and so forth? So we've got to look at everything in, in depth. And um, I'll give you an example where, where we helped a client um, move from, from 1P to 3P and then also reverse of that. So one of our clients, um, they hired us to, to meet with their board of directors and help them understand what is their Amazon strategy. They were already selling some, some products on 1P and they were already allowing third party sellers uh, mm -hmm. to, to sell their products as well. And they had about 40 third party sellers and they were, uh, they were selling to 1P as well. Um, once we, we kind of did an assessment, we found that the financial model actually made more sense for 3P for the vast majority of their assortment, but not all of it. We then uh, worked on creating a hybrid model where a good chunk of the 1P products would be transitioned to 3P, and those items would uh, save them about, uh, and also we would cut down the 40 authorized sellers to five mm. authorized sellers so that they weren't just allowing an eBay. They, they basically were giving every single wholesale customer a free pass to sell products on Amazon, each of which are contributing separate content, separate, you know, they, they had a map price policy, they were violating it to try and steal market share or mar you know, buy box capture and so forth. Um, and we, we, we decided that they would save $3 million, over $3 million a year in EBITDA by, wow. by taking this approach. Um, so what we did is we first helped them write a map policy, minimum advertised price policy, uh, and a channel control policy. And that channel control policy basically said, if we're gonna sell you wholesale, you're only allowed to sell within um, your own e-commerce website or your, e your own brick and mortar stores. Mm -hmm. Nothing beyond that unless you get our express written permission. So then, you know, I flew out to a bunch of their, their, their retail partners and decided who were we going to, who was gonna be the best partner for those five that were going to be remaining, and um, and, and we basically you know, aligned on here's here's where we're going to to start. We're going to have five million uh, or five authorized sellers, and then over time we would dwindle to three, and then one, and then zero. And by doing that, um, they would uh, be able to uh, effectively sell on the channel in a way that was optimized for profitability was better to control the content and had a much better brand experience. And that was really impactful for them. And, and that, that, that client's doing, uh, you know, sizable volume. Yeah. Roughly that's $150 cool. yeah. million dollars a year on Amazon alone. Wow. Um, yeah, when, yeah. when previously their brand was not bought into it, they, their, their board wasn't bought into it. they they were, they were basically just handing the business to all of these unauthorized sellers. Um, yeah. So it's 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 a, it's a process, but it can be very lucrative, and it really allows the brand to grasp the channel and and make it part of their DNA. And I think that's yeah. that's a good approach when you're when you're trying to um, decide yeah. on channel path. And I can share another example um, as well where it made sense to move from three P to one P 
Mm-hmm. Um, this this particular seller was selling uh, artwork that was made to order. And okay. as a 3P seller, uh, even seller fulfilled prime would not work to enable prime and allow them to ship the same day. But as a 1P vendor, we were able to move to uh, a dropship program through Amazon and get prime delivery, but with a longer lead time. And that was a huge uplift in sales and it worked much better for them. And they were able to, to, to see a huge amount of growth because customers are, you know, wanting, you know, faster shipping. Amazon quotes that the prime badge alone uh, will give you 50% upside. And yeah. in, in, in that's of course an average, not everybody sees that, but that's what Amazon and Walmart, by the way, quote um, for, for Walmart SFP as well. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, as you mentioned, it's not a, a cookie cutter approach. I think it's super important to make sure, first of all, your business um, will adapt to that specific uh, methodology of operating. Because uh, with examples that you mentioned, like for certain products and certain brands, 1P works better than 3P and 3P works better than 1P. It's not a, a, mm-hmm. a, a perfect science. And I think mm-hmm. it, that's why the same a time it creates so much confusion especially and you, and you see this all the time like when you talk to amazon sellers more people most people for example don't even know how the vendor program works right so i feel you know yeah. having these conversations and make it public about what are some of the benefits of course um that open the door to you know strategizing okay maybe that's the way i have to go to reach the milestone that i have for my business in the long term um now i guess when it comes to strategy right we have talked about international expansion we have talked about 1p or 3p something that i think i would like to hear your take before we end this episode as well is when it comes to catalog expansion right because i feel Mm -hmm. one of the things that can also significantly allow you to uh, uh, grow your revenue is basically go deep into the data of your brand and figure out what is the things that people usually buy in correlation with your products what extra accessories you can bring to the table variations upsells bundles things like that so how is that playing um um a role into your strategy is this something that you feel being also an important pillar when it comes to uh, growing a business Absolutely. So, um, you know, one of our clients is a, a billion dollar brand that has a, a, a wide variety of products. And mm-hmm. even with a wide variety of products, you'd be surprised how much he's living uh, out <laughs> uh, assortment expansion that they're just not capitalizing on. And the Amazon data is right there telling them this. I mean, just yeah. look at the um, at the, the live website you know, page on Amazon. It says frequently bought together. Exactly. Here, add these three items to if you add the cart button. If you're not looking at that and saying, wait a minute, they're adding my product and this competitor product. Um, why why are they adding this competitor product? And what, what do you need to do to, to, to modify my assortment to meet that need? Sometimes it's as simple as a different price point that they're offering, different size of the product. It could be maybe a different product that is just a different uh, iteration of something you could easily produce. Now you can leverage that information and brand analytics really allows you to see for uh, search results and for uh, your, your, your catalog, what are consumers buying, you know, in relation to this and, 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 and target those items. You know, Amazon's really giving retailers and brands more insight than any other retailer has ever provided in my opinion. And it, if you're a really smart, savvy brand, you can figure out what your consumers want really precisely and target that and expand. On the flip side, you can also identify very easily what is not working. Like if I, you know, if I if I have a hundred items in my catalog, I, I want to make sure that I'm adding twenty new items and discontinuing twenty new items. So I want to make sure that I'm I'm constantly looking at what needs to get added and what needs to get dropped because there needs to be a level of skew efficiency. And if something's not working, maybe you you know you're just not competitive for whatever reason. Maybe there's a bunch of Chinese sellers that offer really the same product as you, and you don't really have a, a unique differentiator. Well, how do you differentiate from it? How do you make it something special where people are willing to pay a premium? Um, we we helped a client once that um, was a, a manufacturer of um, uh, tools and they were made in the USA and and we we helped them. They said we can make anything. What, what should we target? And 
uh, we found that there was this Chinese item that was selling for $33 and uh, it was the leader by far in the, in the category. And we helped this uh, manufacturer develop a product assortment that was a more premium, was, was positioned more premium. And yeah. by doing that, uh, leveraging the fact that they, they were offering a lifetime warranty made in the USA, really worked with their brand team on creating the perfect content from mm. all the all the graphics and videos and everything. I mean, customers were sold that this is the product I want to buy. And if it's something I only want to buy once, like a tool, I want the best. I want something that's going to last me forever. They were willing to spend more than twice that much money. So at first, we, we launched it at $49, sold out the very first month, and eventually mm. raised it to $69 and oh, wow. sold it very successfully at twice the price of a Chinese competitor because we were able to you know, leverage that there was consumer yeah. demand for a product, limited yeah. supply. Now let's position this as a more premium product. And a lot of te- people don't really look at that. They're always like looking at how do I race to the bottom? How can I exactly. cut costs to be the cheapest? And that's oftentimes the wrong approach. Yeah, that's cool, Steve. I mean, to be honest, mm-hmm. um, I value so much all the insights. I know these are um, just a few of the things that Amazon sellers should be looking when it comes to uh, a strategy. There's so many more things that I'm sure we're going to have mm-hmm. many more opportunities in the future to go in depth. But besides that, I thank you so much for you know sharing these insights. I think these three topics, which is international expansion, understanding which way to go with um, 1P3P and a um, catalog expansion as well, is one of the things that even by going to, I mean, both of us go to so many events, I still feel sellers are not having this conversation uh, too often. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, the the purpose of this is to really bring that light bulb and, and tell you, you need to get into work and figure out that for your business. So Steve, uh, how people can find you, because I know this is uh, something that you pretty much do on a, on a daily basis. I mean, you have so many big companies mm-hmm. that work with you and your experience talks by itself. So how people can get in touch and, and work with you. Yeah, so uh, you could find us at crimeguidance.com. And uh, you can also reach me on LinkedIn. Um, Just search Steve Yates or Prime Guidance. And um, you can also reach out to me directly. My cell phone is 972-505-1647. Happy to talk to anybody that has questions. um, And also uh, provide a free listing audit for anybody that, um, you know, wants to see how well positioned am I. I'll be... You'd be surprised at, at the, the, the insights that we may uncover. Uh, just free, no pressure whatsoever. Yeah. Cool, Steve. So thank you so much. A pleasure. And can't wait to, to see you soon at upcoming events. Yeah. Take care, bro. Okay. All right. See Sounds ya. good. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks Vincenzo. Bye-bye. Bye.